the prophet John who wrote the book of Revelation while in vision on the Isle of Patmos on the Aegean Sea, where he was exiled by Roman rulers, wrote a prophecy of the world being overtaken by a single powerful world leader, who dominates politics, religion, industry and commerce. The prophet John the Revelator gave an account of his vision, in the book of Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 to 9. It states, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. One thing for sure is that we now know according to our previous videos on this channel, who the beast power of Revelation 13 is. Last week we identified the beast of Revelation as the Bishop of Rome also referred to as the Pope, and the system that he represents, that is overseen by the Vatican, also referred to as the Holy See. Recently in news articles we've seen that the Pope has strived to bring an end to the Protestant Reformation. This is the end to the protest by other churches called Protestant churches against false and apostate Catholic doctrines and teachings. From Pope Francis became leader of the Catholic Church, he has been extraordinarily busy bringing all denominations of the world together in an ecumenical alliance. He has brought leaders of the world's major religions such as Muslims, Anglicans, Russian Orthodox, Southern Evangelicals in the United States in large groups such as Kenneth Copeland and many other leaders of the evangelical churches throughout the United States and the world. Pope Francis has made it known that people who oppose his faith are looked at as terrorists and that he despises proselytizing. He opposed pastors of other faiths trying to preach to his believers and converting them to other faiths or churches. In bringing even the leaders of the Lutheran faith to join his ecumenical movement and to bring an end to all protests against Roman Catholicism, the Pope is very close to the establishment of a one-world religion. But why is the formation of a one-world religion important to biblical prophecies? Revelation in chapter 13 reading from verses 6 to 8 it states that the beast caused the entire world to worship him. The only possible way that any leader or government can establish a religion in which the world worships him is with the establishment of a one-world religion. Pope Francis has been very successful at establishing this one-world religion in which all the other churches will be led by the Roman Catholic Church, whom it has often refers to as its daughter churches. But how is this church and system blaspheming against God? There are two very prominent ways that this church and its successive popes, bishops and priests have blasphemed the name of God. As seen in previous videos on this channel, the Catholic Church claims that its priests, popes and bishops can forgive sins. Its other claim is its rebellion against God by changing His holy Sabbath day and claim to have solemnized the first day of the week which we know is Sunday in place of God's true Sabbath, which is the seventh day also known as Saturday. A look back at Revelation 13 verses 6 to 8 brings the claim of blasphemy even much clearer, when this power demand to be worshipped and those who do not comply will be persecuted or killed. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In the matter of blasphemy, it is a very fair to conclusion to declare that the fallible sinful men who are priests, popes and bishops of the Catholic faith cannot forgive sins and does not have the power to do so. Neither Jesus or his Father in heaven had conferred upon the Pope or his priests and bishops, the power to forgive sins. 
the Bible has stated that our only mediator is Christ Jesus Himself. The Bible establishes Christ as our mediator in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. It states, For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And in Hebrews 8 verse 6 it reads, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So here beyond any doubt, Christ is established as our only mediator. One thing is certain, is that it doesn't matter who becomes leader of this organization. Their aims and objectives will be the same no matter who succeeds this present Pope. They are representatives of a system and will thrive towards the very same objective no matter who is in leadership. It is for world domination. Below are some important quotes from Catholic publications and other documents that shows that the Pope of Rome occupies a throne of blasphemy against God. They are as follows. This is from the encyclical, The Reunion of Christendom published in 1885. It reads, Pope Leo, stated that the Pope holds upon this earth the place of God Almighty. In the Catechism, can be found the following. The Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth. By divine right the Pope has supreme and full power in faith and morals over each and every pastor in his flock. He is the true Vicar of Christ, the head of the entire Church, the Father and Teacher of all Christians He is the infallible ruler, the founder of dogmas, the author of and the judge of councils, the universal ruler of truth, the arbiter of the world, the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all, being judged by one, God Himself on earth. And also the Pope can make and unmake laws for the entire Church, His authority is supreme and unquestioned. Every bishop, every priest, every member of the Church is subject to Him. Quoting from the Ecclesiastical Dictionary it states, The Pope is of so great dignity, and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the Vicar of God. Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown, as King of Heaven and of Earth and of the lower regions. This is published in Ferraris, Prompta Bibliotheca, in 1763, Volume 6, The Book Papa 2, page 26. Hi folks! isn't what you're hearing the highest type of blasphemy against God. All the titles above belongs to God and God alone, none of these belong to the Roman Pontiff. In completing our reading of the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, we will see how these verses cements the information provided, to prove that the verses in this chapter could only be referring to the Pope of Rome. Reading from verse 10 it states the following. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So the beast appeared to be a harmless lamb appeared out of the earth who looked like a lamb but spoke as a dragon. Please note that the other name for Satan in the Bible is the dragon. And verse 12 of chapter 13 of Revelation continues to read. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Of course the number six hundred three score and six, means six hundred and sixty six. Here is the deception. The beast caused the entire world to worship him, this is the Pope's intent. In Revelation 17 verses 3 to 5, the Bible identifies the colors of the beast of scarlet color, which is the color of the College of Cardinals who elect the Pope. The Bible also identifies the purple color of the woman which represents the fallen church which is also purple and scarlet worn by the bishops and cardinals of the Catholic Church. 
it reads from verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. In understanding chapter 13 of the book of Revelation, we saw two beasts. One was like a leopard with seven heads and ten horns, adorned with ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. We have established why the beast is blaspheming the name of God. It is by claiming to being able to forgive sins, and also the claim to change God's fourth commandments which is God's Sabbath law. But there were other titles that the popes of Rome also claimed to to hold, such as the Vicar of the Son of God, the Forgiver of Sins, King of Heaven, King of Earth, names such as the Supreme Pontiff. There was also the other beast that appears to be a lamb but spoke like a dragon. Appearing to be a lamb but speaking like the devil is how the government of every developed countries of the world will become. They will speak softly at first in order to gain compliance with their laws. But non-compliance will enrage governments to speak like dragons whenever there are those who resist this beast power and preaches against its blasphemy. Even the underdeveloped countries will come under this dragon or satanic power and control. This power will put many to death for exposing its blasphemy. Remember that Revelation 13 verses 15 to 18 states. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. This mark of the beast is opposite to the seal of God, and is the mark of disobedience to God's law and the changing of his laws, but specific rebellion against God's Sabbath law, the fourth commandment, and the followers of the beast for having another God and bowing down to the beast. This is disobedience of bowing down to the beast of false God and worshipping the beast which is a breach of the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So there will be a death penalty for those who refuse to bow to this power, led by the Vatican and Pope of Rome and approved by the devil himself. There will be forced worship legislated by the government to mandate the worship of the false system and its abominable laws and false worship, and will put some of God's children who refuse to submit to this blasphemous system of worship to death. That is why God warns us to come out of her, that we may not partake of her sins and do not receive the seven last plagues that will be poured out on those who will obey and worship the beast and observe his false Sabbath, which is Sunday worship. In the book of Revelation 18 the following quotes are made. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God is therefore warning us to come out of this very same false religion and its daughter churches that preach the very same false doctrines before it is too late. As can be seen in Revelation 18, powerful governments and merchants of mighty countries such as the United States will suffer punishment from God for becoming under the control and power of the beast, and God will punish men with the punishment of fire and plagues, which will result in great countries and large cities to be burned and become desolate with fire, and a fall of all the major economies of the world to commercial and industrial ruin. But the Bible said the whole world wonder after the beast. But this does not include God's people. God's people remained obedient to Him. This will be the punishment for those who worship the beast and bow down to her and are obedient to her laws that goes against the authority of God. Reading from verse 8 it states, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, and mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth, 
who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her, and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas that great city Babylon, that mighty city! For in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold, and silver, and precious stones, and of pearls, and fine linen, and purple, and silk, and scarlet, and all thyine wood, and all manner vessels of ivory, and all manner vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. And saying, Alas, alas that great city, that was clothed in fine linen, and purple, and scarlet, and decked with gold, and precious stones, and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster, and all the company and ships, and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. In all of this God will protect His people. Revelation 14 verses 1-4 reads. And I looked, and, lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. Revelation 14 verse 12 identifies God's people. Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. This battle is proved to be over obedience to the commandments of God. This is a sad end to the beast power, and those who commit spiritual adultery and spiritual fornication with her. God warns, us all to come out of her my people that you partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues in Revelation 18. This is a warning given in the book of Revelation 12, 17 and 18, through God's prophet John, to avoid the wrath of God that will be poured out in the last days, and to exit this fallen church and its false religion, and also the churches that teach its doctrines of abominations and blasphemy. Please be welcome to read the flipbook at your own pace attached to this video for more information, and you may send your questions to our email address posted below regarding our free Bible course and other questions on this video. Thank you for watching and until next time, may the Lord bless you abundantly. Three Messengers Broadcasting Network Proclaiming God's Last Day Message To all the world in this generation Worshipping on Sundays is a normal routine for people all around the world. But looking throughout the Holy Bible, one will see the command by God in both the Old and New Testament that God's holy day is the seventh day of the week which we call Saturday. Even in the New Testament books of the Bible, Jesus, the prophets, or God the Father has never given any command to keep holy, any other day than the seventh-day Sabbath. 
So how and when did Sunday worship became common practice in the Christian Church? It is very clear in the Bible which day is the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is God's fourth commandment of the ten given to God's prophet Moses on Mount Sinai in ancient Mesopotamia. The commandment explained which day is the Sabbath, and the Bible in Exodus 28-11 states. Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. The Sabbath is so sacred that God even forbade men to engage in physical labor or to allow their animals to work on this His holy day. He even commands, that strangers who were not Hebrews were also obligated to keep the Sabbath too. The argument that some people including some pastors, used to claim that the Sabbath was for the Jews only, is debunked in God's fourth commandments and other books of the Bible. In Mark 2:27, it stated that the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Sabbath was made for all men to observe, and not only for the Jewish people. It has been documented in history the exact year when Sunday worship became a part of Christian worship, and that took place when the Romans as an empire, held universal dominance in our world. In the year 321 AD, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Roman Emperor Constantine I, a convert to Roman Christianity, introduced the first civil legislation concerning Sunday in 321 AD, when he decreed that all work should cease on that day, except that farmers could work if necessary. That law, aimed at providing time for worship, was followed later in the same century and in subsequent centuries by further restrictions on Sunday activities. So, it is very clear where the observance of the fall Sabbath began, for it began in the ancient Roman Empire officially as a day of worship by the Roman Emperor Constantine I. Previously to that, Christ and his disciples and the early Christian Church, kept the seventh day, which we now call Saturday as the Lord's Day. Constantine who was a pagan emperor, who claimed to have been converted to Roman Catholic Christianity, introduced a pagan day of worship which is Sunday, into the existing Christian Church of the 4th century. That has been documented in several sources including encyclopedias. Sources including the Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, provides information how the Roman Catholic Church not only admitted to the changing of God's seventh-day Sabbath, but also boasted that they had the authority to do so. Emperor Constantine was a pagan leader of the Roman Empire who was also a sun worshipper who observed the worshipping of the Roman pagan sun god on what the Romans called the Venerable Day of the Sun which we now know as Sunday. So, Sunday was the day offered by the pagans for worshipping the sun god and that was a custom observed by the Roman pagans. Being a pagan day of worship, man does not have the authority to change God's law even though they attempted to do so. Quoting from the Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, the Catholic Church stated. Question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church, in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Question. Why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? A. The Church substituted Sunday for Saturday, because Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday, and the Holy Ghost descended upon the Apostles on a Sunday. Q. By what authority did the Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? Answer. The Church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the plenitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. Rev. Peter Gehrman CSSR, 1946, page 50. In another Catholic publication, the Catholic Christian instructed. These questions and answers were published. Question. Has the Catholic Church power to make any alterations in the commandments of God? Answer. Instead of the seventh day, and other festivals appointed by the old law, the Church has prescribed the Sundays and holy days to be set apart for God's worship, and these we are now obliged to keep in consequence of God's commandment, instead of the ancient Sabbath. 
the Catholic Christian instructed in the sacraments, sacrifices, ceremonies, and observances of the Church by way of question and answer, right Rev. Dr. Chaloner, on page 204. In an abridgment of the Christian doctrine. Question. How prove you that the Church hath power to command feasts and holy days? Answer. By the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, and therefore, they fondly contradict themselves, by keeping Sunday strictly, and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same Church. Question. How prove you that? Answer. Because by keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the Church's power to ordain feasts, and to command them under sin, and by not keeping the rest, of the feasts, by her commanded, they again deny, in fact, the same power. Wrote Rev. Henry Tuberville, DDRC 1833, page 58. In a doctrinal catechism. These questions and answers were provided. Question. Have you any other way of proving that the Church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answers. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Written by Rev. Stephen Keenan, 1851, page, 174, in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it stated, The Church of God has thought it well to transfer the celebration and observance of the Sabbath to Sunday. Page 402, Second Revised Edition in English, 1937. First published in 1566. In the Augsburg Confession, the Catholic Church published the following. They, the Catholics, allege the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day, contrary to the Decalogue, as it appears, neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, they say, is the power and authority of the Church, since it dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. Emperor Constantine was a pagan by religion. The Encyclopedia Britannica gave an account of his conversion to Roman Catholic Christianity. Reading from the Britannica, and from the most recent edition, it states, Constantine's conversion to Christianity had a far-reaching effect. Like his father, he had originally been a votary of the sun, worshipping at the Grand Temple of the Sun in the Vosges Mountains of Gaul, he had had his first vision, albeit a pagan one. So, we now know how Sunday worship, the false Sabbath was introduced into the Christian Church and by whom. Which day did Jesus observe as the Sabbath? In Luke chapter 4 verse 16 the Bible states, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. The Bible also states, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Mark 2 verse 28. Jesus has never kept Sunday as the Sabbath day neither did his disciples. In the book of Acts alone, there are 85 instances where the apostles, even after Christ's resurrection, still kept the Sabbath. They observed the Sabbath both before and after Jesus' death and resurrection. Another example of the apostles keeping the Sabbath is in Acts chapter 17 verses 3 to 5, where the Bible states, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Another example is quoting from Acts 13 verses 13 to 15. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Reading the entire book of Acts of the Apostles, you can find over eighty other instances where the apostles kept the seventh-day Sabbath, and above are some examples of this. We will now recite a poem titled, The Changing of the Sabbath Day in Poetry, by Glendon McFarlane. Constantine the Great, you must answer to the Lord. 
as Rome's most revered pagan, you had tampered with his words. Changing of the Sabbath day from the seventh day to the first. You invoked God's anger, for you have done the worst. An act of blasphemy, an abomination to the Almighty. For Christendom has followed you into apostasy. Revelation has promised a reward to those so bold. A reward of condemnation and not a crown of gold. Your priest and bishops boasted of the power to change. God's words and its authority, and laws of every range. Popes and clerics profess the powers to change God's mind. With damnable claims of authority, in God's words you cannot find. Making claims to God's title and his powers too. Those who reject rebellion, are but a faithful few. Changes to God's Sabbath day, came not by his hands. But by Constantine and pagans with the Edict of Milan. Jesus walked on earth, and in chapter 4 of Luke the Apostle, worshipped on the Sabbath day as his custom, not a hassle, telling us in the book of John, If you love me, my laws obey. Obedience with faith and cleansing is the only way. Apostles Daniel and John prophesied of changes in God's law, and a seven-headed beastly power lying from jaw to jaw, speaking words of blasphemy and attacking of God's people, a corrupted pagan, religious power from their pews to their steeple. The mark of the beast is attack on God's law and his blessed Sabbath day. When perilous times and spiritual darkness gives monumental sways, men have decided to invent their holy days to God, Christmas and Easter sanctioned by pagans, and it is very sad. But the true sacred day he created we've ignored it's bad. Then our lives are twisted when we are put to task. When we disobey the Lord refusing what he asked, it's by faith and obedience we're in the heart of God, with works through His power and cleansed by His blood. Works do not exist alone but sanctified with truth. Obedience to the Word of God is the seed that grows the shoot. Thank you for viewing this presentation, and please remember to share it with friends and subscribe, and encourage your friends, co-workers, family and neighbors to share and subscribe to these videos also. And may the Lord watch over you and bless you abundantly. Until next time. Please have a wonderful day.